So each week we are reading a psalm or a selection of a psalm because the psalms are so good for our mental health and really give us freedom to really express our emotion before God. And this psalm in particular is really an invitation to the one who created us to continue to help us explore our mental health so that we can experience greater connection with him, ourselves, and others. So at the beginning of the psalm, if you notice, you might want to go study this or read it this week. It says, you have searched me and known me. And then at the end, there's the request again, please search me and, and know me. So, um, and we, we have these great resources on the website, as, as Josh mentioned, and we've done some activities. We've done some mindful slow flow yoga. We've done um, some grief share, surviving the holidays kind of things. I think we'll probably continue to try to put some things on the calendar to help you and ourselves just implement uh, mindful practices to help us grow in our um, mental health and wellness. So um, I'm going to take us back a little bit, and I don't know if this is working or not. I'll just probably lean on Henry. Okay. So before we go to the next slide here, uh, I'm going to take us back to the 80s. When I grew up, there's a commercial that I think of often that terrified me. It was a gentleman who would pick up an egg, and what did he say? He said, this is your brain. And he pointed to a cast iron skillet, just like the one I cook breakfast on often, and said, These are, this is drugs. Then he cracked it, and he said, this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? And then the, you just heard the sizzle of the egg just frying, and it was like, you know, this was a partnership for a drug-free America. If you do drugs, you're going to fry your brains, and it's over. That's kind of what was thought about our brains, our minds. Like, you fry it, and it's done. And that terrified me. It's like, if you're going to learn a language, you got to learn it now. you got to do all the things right now. And I'm, I, I had anxiety around this. Um, but thankfully, actually with scientific development, we have very good news about the nature of our brains. Um, especially if we're not satisfied with our current mental state. And um, so... You know, most of us know that your prefrontal cortex is not fully developed by the time you're age what? 26. 26. Is it up now? 25, 26? Yeah. So we're, we're doing all sorts of things before those ages, before we can really think clearly. So all of us, whether or not you, you did drugs or, or whatever you did, our, our brains need to be able to change and grow and develop and mature and become more healthy. So there's a great author named Carolyn Leaf, and in her book, Switch on Your Brain, The Key to Peak Happiness, Thinking, and Health, she says, and this is research from 2013, so I'm sure the last decade has brought even, even more uh, research in this area. She says, our brain is changing moment by moment as we are thinking. By our thinking and choosing, we are redesigning the landscape of our brains, so your choice to come here on this Sunday morning, your choice to sing, to clap, all of these choices is actually continually changing the, not, not just the kind of abstract thoughts you have, but the actual wiring of your brain. You can actually rewire your brain. And she tells us that our brains generate more electrical impulses in one day, that's the next slide, than all the cell phones on the planet. Now, I shared this quote um, a, couple, a few years ago, and I think it was Taylor Hill guy said, actually, that's not quite true. Maybe cell phones have gotten a little bit better. But nonetheless, our brains are a beautiful thing. You can go to the next slide there. Um, our brains are absolutely beautiful. So let's see here. There we go. So they're not just, you know, you make one mistake and they're fried completely. Our brains are constantly changing, and we have these, 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 um, these ruts that our brains come into, and some of them are really, really good, right? Like when you're driving, you get in your car, and immediately you know how to park your car. You, you have a mental map of your car. When I get into our vibe, I immediately know how much space I have for where I can drive. I don't even think about that. I have neuro, I'm sorry, I have neuro pathways trained. When I get into our Yukon, my, my whole map of our vehicle changes. This is because we're, we're rewiring our brains constantly. 
So um, science has taught us about neuroplasticity. So this is the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural con connections. And so the saying is neurons that fire together, wire together. So you can actually teach an old dog new tricks when it comes to humans. So this is really, really good news. So think about, we've talked some about drugs, but think about something like pornography, where you're wiring your brain to seek intimacy on a, on a screen and these things that are not healthy for you, and that impacts the intimacy with your spouse, perhaps. You can actually rewire your brain over time to be in a more healthy place to experience intimacy with your spouse, rather than the damage that was done for maybe for some years of pornography. This is, this is good news for us. So this newest scientific discovery, very hopeful. No more fear that this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, you're done. It's also consistent with what the scriptures have taught us all along. We can retrain our brains. We can rethink things and change our minds dramatically. Now, of course, when Christ returns, we learn that we will have a, a new body and a new heaven, new earth, and we'll be made perfect. So we're not going to be made perfect this side of eternity, but we can have drastic improvements in our brains. So I'm going to turn uh, to a letter written by Paul to the Jesus followers in Rome. So as we think about uh, the Roman believers, um, they had a lot going on. A lot of things were shaping their worldview, their minds. Uh, we had Gentiles coming from all sorts of what they could get their hands and eyes on coming into the faith. We had Jews coming from all sorts of religious trauma and all sorts of challenges. So essentially, you know, their brains were just as fried as any of ours. And they were coming together uh, in the early church, and Paul is writing to them, and trying to teach them how to live in the way of Jesus, uniting them in the way of Jesus, which is what we're trying to do today. And he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by, and what he says next, I think is significant. In this, in this letter, he doesn't say be transformed by the blood of the cry, of cry, sorry, the blood of Christ, that's very important. He doesn't say be transformed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's involved. It's very, very important. He says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So 2,000 years ago, Paul writing, almost 2,000 years ago, Paul writing to the early church, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to pray for us again and then think through the biblical idea of transformation of the mind and then some practical tools on how we can begin to experience this. Father, thanks again for the morning. Thanks for all who are gathered here. We are grateful. We're grateful for the guests that are with us. We pray that we can be a space, a place where people can walk through here a mess, mentally, physically, all the things, and that together we can experience healing and wholeness and growth and movement in that direction, and that we can invite others into the same. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. So transformation of the mind. <laughs> Excuse me. I just want to look a little bit at a few passages in the scriptures. We're not going to teach on all these passages, but just to show you how much God is interested in our mind. So a lot of times in church or religious circles, uh, sometimes we, we separate the mind and our thoughts and all these things from our experiences or um, things like that. So he says, I'm sorry, Jesus in response, this is, there we go. Henry, are you clicking it or am I? Okay, let me put this over here, guys. I got a lot of technology, as you know, going on. I will be done with that. I need to rewire my brain. <laughs> Someone pointed out to me once that I was always fiddling with this. Um, you know, we're all on the spectrum, I'm sure, of neurodivergence at some level. So you, you're welcome to point those things out. <laughs> Rewire the brain. Okay, 
Mark 12, 30 to 31, Jesus, when asked, you know, what's the greatest commandment? He answers correctly, of course. It's Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. So he's able to differentiate between all these aspects that make us up into one being to respond and relate to our creator. The second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, which if you've been around at all, probably know these commandments. In Mark 1, 14, when he comes out, of, when Jesus comes out of the gate with his ministry, it says he goes into Galilee, he's proclaiming the good news. And when he's proclaiming the good news in Mark 1, 15, this is what he says. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, this word repent is metanoia, which means change your mind, change your thinking. So the whole Christian life is, I'm headed this way in my thinking, my thought process, all these things. Now, in light of this news about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I need to change my thinking. I need to start rewiring my brain to come into conformity with the way of Christ. Colossians 3, Paul writing to the church in Col Colossae, he says, Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand. And then verse 2 of chapter 3, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. There are truths about you, if you are in Christ, that you're not going to just immediately feel, that you actually need to train your mind to comprehend and think about. In 1 Peter 1, Peter writing to, um, the, the, I think, the diaspora, the, those who are dispersed, and Nero is killing Christians and all these things, and and this is, this is what he tells them to do. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, in some translations it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Like, prepare for battle. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Christ is revealed at his coming. A few chapters later, in 1 Peter 4, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves with the same attitude, with the same mind as Christ. Listen to that language. It sounds like he's talking to a people who are in a battle. And does it not feel like a battle? Even if you don't believe in the supernatural or in Christ, when we send our kids to schools or we step through the doors, our world feels like a battle. But of course, as you come to faith in Christ and read the scriptures, you know there is a spiritual battle that rages around us, and it's a battle for the mind, a battle for the way we think about ourselves, the world, and God, and others. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The pattern of this world, well, let's just turn to 2 Corinthians 10. Paul writing to the church in Corinth, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage world war as the world does. And we can see how the world wages war, whether it's, you know, political entities or just people out on Facebook waging war against one another. We don't do that. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So we think about the divine power of God, the same power that creates the universe, raises Jesus from the dead. But this power is said to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The spiritual life, the spiritual battle is a battle of the mind, a battle of ideas about what is true about me, about you, about God, about our world. And I don't have a slide for this, but if you look at Ephesians 6 and read that, the famous passage about um, the armor of God, listen to the, the, the words of Paul related to the armor of God to equip you and I to step out into the world into this spiritual battle. He says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. And we watch horror films and there's like, 
demons coming at you and they're attacking you physically, but that is not what is happening here. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of the dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So put on the full armor of God so you can stand. And this is what the armor is. The belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness, knowing who you are in Christ, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the message of Jesus. Change your thinking to follow the king of peace, Christ. The shield of faith, believing in what you don't see, but yet you have good evidence to believe in. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, the word of God, praying. So this is a battle for the mind. In fact, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's not COVID, it's not the flu. It's a lingering cough for the last four or five weeks. The spiritual battle is a battle for your mind and your mental health truly is a matter of life or death. And as some of us have experienced this up close and personal, our community has experienced this even recently. I wanted to share before our application briefly, because I think everyone who's taught has shared a little bit of their own journey with mental health, um, especially those of us kind of coming from the church background where there's stigmas connected to mental health. It's like, let me just pray and trust God, right? I don't need therapy. I just need Jesus. But we're talking about ther Jesus and therapy. Um, you know, if I break my leg, I'm going to take some pain pills and try to fix it physically, but if I have chemical imbalances, no, I can't take medication because I just need to trust Jesus, right? Um, I came out of those stigmas for sure. And I like to talk about mental health and what I call the double whammy in the church, which is you might be experiencing anxiety and now all of a sudden you're anxious about your anxiety because you're supposed to follow Jesus and he told you what to believe in the Bible, right? Or de you get depressed as a follower of Christ, then you're depressed about your depression because you should be following Jesus. Jesus is enough, right? As it, uh, don't raise your hand, but anyone experience that within the church? I sure have. Um, so years ago, 18 years ago, um, I was, we, we talk about stages of spiritual growth and can't remember, did, did you call it the ethical stage or Josh, you're the first stage where you get stuck. Oh, no, I, could, I, I didn't have it in my nose either. That stage where you get, you get excited about Jesus and you're kind of doing all the right things, everything's black and white. And then I got married to Maris, and um, things were not just black and white. And I started to learn categories of spiritual direction and, and that um, sometimes the theology we say we believe doesn't match up with our own experience and we need extra help. Fast forward to just nine years ago where um, my own father, who had been um, pastor of a church for 20, 20 years or so, resigned and made an attempt on his life. And he was the one who his spiritual disciplines were just solid, but yet his anxiety, and he shared about this in a variety of contexts, his anxiety had just taken over. And that it's like, what is happening here? There is more going on than meets the eye. And um, so it really uh, helped me to, th to, to think deeply about um, the need for therapy, medication, to give us a, a chance to have our minds um, healthy so that we can begin to walk more closely with Jesus. So my own journey, um, I was kind of the guy who develops the categories and like, therapy is great for you. Medication is great for you. I, I, I believe it can be helpful, but I'm going to make it on my own, right? Because I'm tough, I'm strong. And so I, as I've heard many, even in this room, reflect and others reflect, like, if I would have just known and started therapy earlier or started some medication, and yes, in conversation with my doctor and not overusing it earlier, the quality of life could have been so much better. So that was sort of me. So we look back and Praise God that that neuroplasticity is a thing and we can change. So my own journey with therapy really started three years ago. And about a year ago, 
you know, um, sorry, that wasn't a full sentence. COVID hits, right? And a lot of us who feel like we're strong, we're holding on, we're holding things together, and it's just wearing you down. And not to mention just church life, and we've shared off and on in here about the challenges of leading a church and experiencing loss, and we want to be a place where people can come and, and experience growth and healing from church hurt, but we're even a place where people have experienced church hurt. And finally, I just in conversation with my doctor, it's like, maybe something could help, help me out a little bit. And a year ago, um, I started a journey with uh, an antidepressant as well, and just a, just a low dose. And um, So I'm, I'm grateful for God's patience and kindness with me and those around me. And uh, at our midweek meetup, someone was sharing that um, you might be feeling okay with your own mental unhealth, but you're having an impact on those around you, perhaps. So out of kindness uh, to those that are in your family or around you, listen to people and what they're sharing with you and, and be open to taking steps. Um, okay, so that is a little bit of my own, my own journey there. We're all in process. Um, I wanted to share some practical ways that we can care for our minds. And there's so many different things and different practical things that we could do. And um, please do not try to implement all of these starting tomorrow. <laughs> Conveniently, we're, we're right at the beginning of Thanksgiving week, so it's maybe it's a good time to cultivate some of these practices. Advent is coming up again. Another a rhythm within our calendar maybe where you could try to implement a practice or maybe two. And some of these are practices that I get to implement um, in my, my new job. I'm a social emotional coach in an elementary school, in Lee Elementary. And it's such a cool job um, to, to literally try to help kids with their own mental health, to refocus, to regroup, to, to do the things that I'm about to share here. And all of the stuff it applies all ages. You know, we don't hit a certain age where it's like, well, we can't grow anymore. We can't change anymore. Yes, change can become more difficult. I've experienced that in my 40s, recovering from all sorts of things. It becomes more difficult, but not impossible. So the first um, way that we can care for our minds, the way I can care for my mind, is talk to myself. Um, talk to myself. So not like a, you know, a pre person who's lost their mind just walking down the street talking to themselves, but <laughs> positive self-talk. So we talk to ourselves with 300 to 1,000 words per minute, more than four times faster than we can talk out loud. So you can read faster than you, it, to yourself than you can out loud. So if you wake up with a negative mindset, we can tell ourselves 4,000 negative words within five minutes. That's how we start our day, before we've even had coffee. And I see this with adults, but with kids, it's just right there. You hear kids, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I can't do it, this is too hard, no one loves me. They literally articulate it out loud. I think a lot of adults are saying these things on repeat throughout the day. No one cares about me, I'm worthless we can replace and we can begin to train our mind by talking to ourselves rather than just listening to ourselves. So you've got to be intentional. I'm learning. I got this. This is difficult, but I can get through it. I am loved. I am cared for. I am worth it. Um, in Psalm 42 and 43, the psalmist there, and it's, if you read the psalm at the beginning, it says these are psalms of the sons of Korah. The psalmist says, why, my soul, are you downcast? So here he is talking to himself. Why so disturbed within me? And then he's going to tell himself what to do. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So another um, little spiritual practice is preaching the gospel to yourselves daily. So speaking those truths about who you are 
in Christ. And if you go back and look at this Psalm 42 and or 43, um, I'd encourage you to go read the story about Korah's rebellion in Numbers 16. We're not going to dive into it too deep here. But this is a Psalm of the sons of Korah. Those descendants of Korah, their, their fathers led a rebellion and the earth split open and swallowed them whole. Do you remember that story? Kind of obscure. Talk about trauma. Talk about religious trauma. And that's following them. And so they have a lot to work through. And here they are speaking to themselves um, to get back into good place, uh, mental place with God. <coughs> Um, our, our passage that we're in, Romans 12, Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, and so they need to be thinking and telling themselves about God's mercy, the first 11 chapters that led up to this. In view of all that, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, not conforming to the pattern of this world, but trans being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the first thing, literally, is to talk to yourself. And maybe even today or as you go or even in this moment, think about what you're thinking. Is it, is it good? Is it reaffirming who you are in Christ? Um, or is it negative? The next, um, and it's kind of related, is meditate. So Paul in, in uh, Philippians 4.8, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So Paul's saying, scan the world, look around. Anything that is good, right, admirable, think about those things, right? There's a great book, um, I think Josh put on Facebook, like, hey, what, what's a book or podcast or something that's really helped you in your mental health? Uh, the, the one that I responded with, and there's lots of great stuff out there, it's a book called Finding Quiet by J.P. Moreland, a Christian scholar, uh, but it's his story of overcoming anxiety and practices that brought him peace. So this is his reflection on this idea of meditation. So he says, Besides meditating on specific biblical texts, which is great, we should do that. Scripture memory is a great thing. It's a great way to, to retrain your brain, give you fodder for the Holy Spirit to call to mind. He says, there are two scriptural strands of meditation sometimes overlooked. In the first scriptural strand, we are also urged to meditate on general abstracts, or sorry, general abstract themes in scripture. For example on agape love, on justice, on hope, and so forth. Thus, the Apostle Paul, he goes on, wisely urges that whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. He continues, certainly we'd want to remember and meditate on God's wonderful acts toward us and those we care about. So remembering God's goodness to us through time. Remembering the times we received or gave of ourselves in love or extended forgiveness, times when the presence of God was especially precious and answers to prayer, those are also proper objects for meditation. He continues, along these same lines, we can meditate on anything that is edifying and encourages us toward a life of Christian maturity and gratitude toward God, whether grand or small. In God's creation is a vast repository of objects to ponder and to offer thanks to God about, such as attending to the sound of rain, to ducks swimming in a pond, or even to the wonderful tastes of what we eat. So yes, the world is a harsh place. There's a lot of ugliness, a lot of brokenness, but there's a lot of beauty. Anywhere you look is, is fodder for you to retrain your brain and meditate on God's provision. I mean, if, as I look around here, as I think, even my glasses, wow, that's amazing. I look around here and I, I hear the cries of babies. That, that we, could we could spend the rest of our time just meditating on the joy of the birth 
of Skylar, however long ago it was, what was it, six months? Eight, I was off. And in the last um, paragraph of this quote, he says, when one is anxious and depressed, the so-called grand things of life may be difficult to hold one's attention. When you're depressed, it might be hard for you to reflect on the propitiation of the blood of Christ. Big theological concept. But anyone can start by being thankful for the taste of one's, mor one's morning coffee or a glass of orange juice. How wonderful of God to create a world with such gracious pleasures. So there's a lot out there that we can meditate on, begin to experience transformation of the mind. The last practice I want to mention is how we can train our minds is to cultivate gratitude. And conveniently, it's Thanksgiving week. So Philippians 4, that whole chapter of Philippians 4 is great to go study, learn, maybe med memorize. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness or in the English Standard Version, it's translated, let your reasonableness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So this is the reasonable way to live. And uh, again, we're first century. We have challenges. We have difficulties. But we, we live in relative ease and comfort compared to the church in Philippi. But this is a reasonable way to live. He says, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's what the Psalms are, right? Presenting your anxieties, your grievances and things to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. With thanksgiving, he says, gratitude is the reasonable response to what you're experiencing in life. So two specific practices with gratitude that I, I like, that I, um, one I've implemented daily and one I've, I'm trying to implement. And these are actually from a study by Jeff Human, Huffman, um, a guy at Harvard Medical School. Um, the first is a gratitude journal. So Jeff, Jeff Huffman performed a study actually of suicidal patients. So the study is called Feasibility and Utility of Positive Psychology Exercises for Suicidal Impatients. So he gave them nine different practices, and then he wanted to see what were the best practices for impacting their overall uh, quality of life and mental health. And I will share with you those two. So the first one is this, is, is this uh, gratitude journal, or three good things exercise. So participants are asked to write down three things that went well each day and their causes every night for one week. So the three good things exercise uh, produced. And so if you're, if you're into science, you can go read this journal article. It's great. This, this gratitude journal exercise produced 2% increase in happiness in a week. So if you want to increase your happiness 2% by next Sunday, do this. 5% increase after a month, and a 9% increase at six weeks. So there you go. There's your research back um, data for what Paul's been telling us 2,000 years ago. Um, so I, I had listened to a talk that highlighted this, this um, I guess, this, this study years ago. And then when COVID hit, I thought to myself, how am I going to make it through this? I'm going to start that gratitude journal. So the next slide has my last since, the, since March of 20. When did COVID hit? 2020? Yeah. So every day for the last several couple of years, that's, those are my gratitude journals. And I'm, I'm not perfect with it. I'll miss a few days sometimes, and I go back and kind of retroactively fill it in. It's like, oh, yes, I did see a butterfly on that day. That was awesome. <laughs> Or, you know, it's like, you know, today I was terrible in the gym, but at least I made it. So it, it, it's one for me that has been good. Now, have I experienced two, five, nine percent increase in happiness? I'm not sure. I'm kind of afraid to stop doing it, though. <laughs> so 
Yeah, please don't. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it used to be at night before I went to bed, but I'm not good at night, as many of you know, anytime after 8.30 or 9. So in the morning, ideally hit the gym. Coffee and contemplation is next. Coffee, gratitude journal. It's been great. It's been good for me. Probably one of the things I've been most consistent in. I'm not a very consistent person with these things. So there's your gratitude journal, something I submit to you. I would love to hear if you try it, what your experience is. The next thing I'll share is a gratitude letter and visit. Simple, basic stuff, stuff that we know. Um, but actually, there's, there's um, research to back up the quality of life improvements we can experience. So participants were given a week to write and then deliver a letter of gratitude in person to someone who had been especially kind to them but had never been properly thanked. So maybe you have the thought, oh, I should thank that person, but never follow through with it. Um, so researcher Martin Seligman found that the gratitude visit immediately increased happiness by 10%. So if you were to write a gratitude letter today, increased happiness likely of about 10%. How cool is that? But these results cut in half in a week and totally gone in six months. So I guess we need to keep writing gratitude letters and delivering them to people. Simple things. I mean, Paul, Paul said, I would love to be with you in person, but he wrote letters. He couldn't hand deliver them. He did the best thing. He sent them with a messenger, right? And maybe you can't hand deliver to that friend who lives states away, but you can mail it and experience quality of life improvement, mental health improvement. And this is what Coach Bill Snyder does, right? He's known for writing, handwriting notes to people. It's awesome. So as we think about putting this into practice, just a simple question, how will you begin to care for your mind this week during Thanksgiving and next month during Advent? So you can go to the next slide. Um, Oh, I wanted to share that. Yeah, so in, in school, um, kids are giving me paintings and things, and, and I'm like, I should give them a thank you note, right? How, and I have not even written the thank you cards and handed them off yet, although I did draw that dinosaur and make my own thank you card. Thank you from Mr. Deaver. I'm already feeling joy and happiness just knowing that I'm going to be able to hand these to these kids. So... Anyways, gratitude letter and visit. So how will you put this into practice? How will you care for your mind this week? Maybe choose one thing. And then I would encourage you, look ahead to Advent and say, okay, when Advent comes, I'm going to add this practice so we can take it one step at a, at a time. So next week, uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving, Justin Kastner is going to wrap up our series on mental health, and then after that, we'll, we'll start Advent, which I'm looking forward to very much. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up, and I would also invite you to stand. Um, so a, a simple practice, so this is a breathing practice that I want to introduce to you. I introduced this to midweek meetup, and um, I've been thinking about these types of practices much more, hanging out with elementary kids, but I always tell them, this is good for adults as well. And that's when the teacher over in the corner stands up and joins the class. Um, so this is called Breath of Joy. So class, it'll be three quick breaths through your nose, breathe through the nose, hold, then out through the mouth. And these breaths are going to correspond with movement. So sometimes a little movement can really just help your overall mental well-being. So the movements are, you've got to make sure you have space. We don't want to run into anyone. <laughs> Everyone put your hands out in front of you. That's the first movement. Second movement. Third movement. So if you've been, oh, I, want to hold, I want to raise my hands in church. Here, we're all doing it together. <laughs> And then last movement is if you can, touch your toes. So really four movements. So we'll do this three times. 
And then we will do the Lord's Supper, uh, the Lord's Prayer, Lord's Supper, and, and sing together. So each time you reach down to touch your toes, you might get a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Okay, you ready? Here we go. There we go. Now we'll hold this one the longest. Good job. Thank you so much. I let you guys, yeah, good job. Keep your hands. I let you guys off easy. I usually let the kids hold it much longer. Okay. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together, and then we invite you to the Lord's Supper.